Hey, everybody. <laughs> Checking in there. I hope everybody's doing good. It is Tuesday. TA Tuesday's back. There's a lot of stuff to cover. Talking about a lot of on-chain stuff, as well as technical analysis and some of our favorite names and find out exactly where they are right now and things are shaking up. So let's jump in and not waste any time with you guys. Switch cameras and go through what we have. Ha! I have to always love doing that. It's like I'm throwing the slides up in the air. So uh, here we are. TA Tuesday, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, math, money, and freedom. You guys know the drill as usual. And this is edutainment, not financial advice. But this kind of weird situation about what happened. Obviously, we had another one of these so-called flash crashes. But high level, first of all, I did a video yesterday and then I got blamed. Five minutes after my stream, Bitcoin tanked. And it's like, you crashed the market. No, I didn't. I didn't. I don't have that much influence at all. And I would never do that anyway. What was kind of interesting is the sentiment out there in the market. It's like, you guys are all like professionals at this stage. Nobody is getting anxious anymore. So there's no what they call max pain, which means the capitulation maybe has not happened yet. So I don't think we're out of the woods. Not enough pain. I think we're going to take another step down. I said that to a bunch of people this morning. And uh, that's what I think. So let's talk a little bit about the flash crash. This is the stuff. Crypto flash crash wipes out billions. Well, it sure did. So the price of Ethereum, things like Binance, Solana, the meme coins all got hammered. Everything down 7%, 8% in overnight trading. But of the four most valuable cryptocurrencies, they all fell at about 10%. That includes like Binance, Solana, Ethereum, Cardano, etc. All got hit hard. Now, the global cryptocurrency market as well fell. The market cap dropped over 6% to about $2.78 trillion. And we were up above $3 trillion a few days ago. So that was a big hit too. And um, I think about $170 billion was wiped out at least maybe more, maybe more like $200 billion at least. Let's, let's talk more about exactly what happened. And here, another quick article, uh, believe that there's a couple of things in play here. Um, I'm a firm believer that the market is heavily shorted by hedge funds, and the hedge funds are shorting it heavily because of some Mt. Gox stuff. But there's also a whole bunch of other theories as well that the uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum retreated because of the Biden infrastructure bill. As you guys know, in the US, they're going to print more money to do more stuff, and they're going to try to tax more people to pay for it, etc., etc. But it's just going to end up not generating a lot of jobs, stuff like that. But I'm not going to get into that at all. But there are some concerns about some of the new regulations for tightening how crypto is handled, how crypto is taxed. Uh, the new bill also put mandates on brokers, which is a very wide definition which they're trying to fix as well, must report any digital asset transactions over $10,000 to the IRS. So obviously, the US government wants to tax the heck out of crypto people. So don't ever mess with tax authorities, because if they do find you and <laughs> they black mark you, you're black marked for life. So they'll be hounding you forever, unless you move to a tax-free jurisdiction. Anyway, so speaking of this, this ties in as well to some other theories that are out there, and that is the correlation between Bitcoin and the Dixie. So I'm going to pop up a chart here. Now, this looks really, 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 really messy, but I'm trying to impart a lot of information. I did come up with a chart a few week, a week or so back about the Dixie correlation to Bitcoin over the last 10 years. Well, this is another one. This one I added, this is a chart, uh, I think, from a Wolf Trader. And I made some adjustments to it and made some additions. So you can see there are teal arrows and orange arrows. That's all I want you to focus on. We'll talk about the rest of the stuff afterwards. But when you look at the teal arrows at the beginning of the left, so we're going back to 2012, historically, every time the Dixie spikes, Bitcoin lags. But after a Dixie, the dollar index spikes, Bitcoin spikes. So you see it first, 2012, 2013. You see it again. 20, late 2014, early 2015. And there wasn't a huge spike with Bitcoin uh, because 2015 is a bit of a flat year. But then you see tw early 2016, big spike. A couple of months later, Bitcoin spiked. And that was the 2017 kind of bull market. Then Dixie Falls, Bitcoin 
goes kind of flat for a while. And then circa 2020, uh, the Dixie spiked, and then Bitcoin spiked uh, circa after April, May, June uh, time frame as well after the C19 situation. And here we are again. It is late 2021. We've got that next big teal spike. And that orange spike at the top has yet to be seen if it's right or not. But again, if history repeats, that's what could happen. Now, the other thing to point out here is if you look at the 2013 Bitcoin versus Dixie, it kind of gasses out. The Dixie gasses out at the technical target range of about 97. And uh, this percentages on the log chart, if what happened in 2013 were the same, it would bring Bitcoin up per my orange arrow to about $390,000. I know that's silly talk, that's hopium, but that's just comparing the timeframes with the same multiples. And again, multiples aren't what they used to be. So the way I like to think of multiples, you've seen this before, everything for me in math is in thirds, but the multiples I believe could be a third of what they were back in 2013, which means that 390K trans translates to about 130K. But I got more to show you guys. So here, we're going to look at, everybody's talking about coin days destroyed today. So this is uh, one of the key things. Basically, when old coins with large accumulated lifespans are spent, it will destroy a greater number of coin days and is often associated with long-term investors exiting positions. Okay, So bull markets usually absorb many, many months of this distribution, but a selling continues the probability of establishing local or global top increases. So if you look at this chart, you'll see a couple of different things. The big orange in the middle is the big bull market distribution. Again, going back to what happened between November 2020 and spring of this year. Then the spending slows. That's the brown stuff next to it. And then you've got the accumulation phase from July to basically end of October. That was gradual accumulation. And for the first time, we saw, per some charts I covered a few days ago, we saw the first modest spending begin. And the key that's important is the magnitude of the CDD, which is the coin days destroyed, in H1 2021 is notably higher and will sustain for months. And this highlights how an abundance of demand through the bull was capable of soaking up newly distributed supply. So net-net, the beginning of spend by the whales is actually a bullish indicator. Many people think it's actually bearish, but it's actually bullish. And that spending can be sustained by the market for a long time. So that's the big message here. Second of all, this is the realized cap, uh, the entity adjusted realized cap. And the key thing here, real simply put, is uh, it is a very intuitive metric. And it basically looks at when every coin last moved and the amount of realized capitalization, capitalization of that move. So each time a coin is moved at a profit, it'll add to the realized cap. And conversely, if it's moved at a loss, it'll take away from the realized cap. So if you bought something at 60,000 and sold it at 50,000, one coin that would take $10,000 away from the realized capitalization. Real simple. But the key message to take away from here is the realized cap has resumed an uptrend and reached $450 billion. So as coins are distributed and revalued higher, this goes up because Bitcoin is more expensive now. And this represents a net capital inflow of $50 billion since the previous peak in May. Now, when I look at my little table on the left, you'll see the calculation. $50 billion over 180 days, that is about $277 million, $278 million every day money flow into Bitcoin to sustain it at this level or to make this move over the, since over the last six months. So that's how much uh, the money needs to come in. And that is coming in. You can track it by looking at the money going into things like GBDC, etc. Now, the other thing is Meyer multiple to see where we are so far. Basically, per this, we still have a long way to go. And this is calculated as a very simple effective ratio uh, of Bitcoin price and the 200-day moving average. And the distance we are away from the 200-day moving average. Real simple. The 200-day move average and how high it goes. And I'll show you some Bitcoin charts real shortly to show you how far we are away from that 200-day moving average. But this Meyer multiple is very far away from that pink line at the bottom. 
And that typically signifies we're getting to the top of a bull market. So once you go above that red line, that's the time when those who want to take some off the table maybe could think about doing that. Now, currently with the Meyer multiple at 2.4, this should take us to about $110,000 for syndication. Now, this next one here, this is what's called the top price model. And this was originally created by Willy Woo. And all of these charts are from Glassnode. And this is uh, an empirically fitted model. It looks at multiplying the all-time average price by a factor of 35. The average price of Bitcoin is now $6,100. And that gives a current cycle top at about $214,000. So we'll see, you know, we're, we're throwing out some big kind of hopium numbers here, but again, all of these things are based on history and these ratios that have worked over the last 10 years, who knows if they'll work in the future, but they're all pretty bullish. And plan B came out and pounded his fist on the table. And he still believes we are still good to go for a 98K Bitcoin in November and 135K in December. This guy, this guy is either completely eccentric or brilliant or I don't know, but he just, he's not backing down at all. So we'll see where this can go. Now let's look at this. This is the first TA chart we'll look at today. This blue arrow shows a perfect bounce. I mean, you can't make this up off the 50 day moving average. And it's the first time it touched it since 4th of October, which is the last time on a TA Tuesday I mentioned it to you. So what does this tell you? So 50 day moving average is the snipe zone for you all today. And uh, this is, but you know, 48,500, or sorry, $58,501, $59,000, even anything under $60,000 is a good time to buy, but I do believe we have a little more to dip because we haven't felt that max pain. Everybody's kind of cool as a cucumber. You know, Bitcoin falls $7,000 in a week or so, and everybody's like, yeah, we're okay with that. Time to buy, but there's no max pain. And that's what we need to shake out a lot of the margin longs that are out there. So next thing, uh, this is a little article from Lynn Alden, just a little bit of news I thought was interesting. Um, then she came out and said, uh, Bitcoin is better than tech stocks. And it all goes back to scarcity and how the CEO of a company can issue more shares if they want, etc., etc. But Bitcoin has no CEO. It's not tied to earnings or revenue. It's basically measured as a supreme money out there in the world. So she also believes as it's adopted more widely, it'll go up in value. So in her opinion, it's a better investment than a high-flying tech stock which is interesting. Now, in a little bit of Michael Saylor news, before we get off the Bitcoin train, uh, he, he said Bitcoin versus gold, a la Michael Saylor. He said, gold is jewelry marketed by sales professionals for a commission. So brilliant. In fact, um, I had a sidebar with Michael Saylor and him and I discussed how people like Peter Schiff don't even own gold and they spend their whole life selling it. And that is just should be criminal behavior in my opinion. Anyway, I would never do that. Now, that was Michael Saylor's point of view. As per the gold bugs, gold is going to remain a solid inflation hedge. Okay, it hasn't done very well over the last 11 years. But anyway, uh, that's from the gold bugs, so watch what you hear. Now let's switch gears and talk about Ethereum for a second. This news is out today, and uh, Rob from Digital Asset News touched on this. I was actually looking at these exact same charts when his video touched on it today. So I hope people don't think I'm copying him, but this is very important to show. This shows the complete drainage of Ethereum from exchanges. And you can see that line down on the right-hand corner, right-hand bottom corner. Uh, the Ethereum exchange balance went from, I think it was 18, and 18 million to about 16 and a half million, like a rock. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the total circulating supply of Ethereum, about 118 million, it's going deflationary. So call it 115 million. Sometime early next year, the supply and exchanges is 16 and a half million. So basically there's only about 13.94% of Ethereum supply on exchanges. So why do we care? Obviously, shorter the supply, the more that's being tied up in things like staking and usage for doing things like buying and selling NFTs and paying extremely high gas fees. It's expensive. So let's uh, look at the Ethereum chart real quick. This one did not quite 
hit the 50 day moving average like Bitcoin. But what it did do, it shattered through my support line that's been there since September. That's the green line. It's kind of like the channel we've been bouncing off of ever since September, nearly three months now. And it smashed right through it. I thought we had solid support, but I did not expect that type of uh, quick crash. Now we are down at about $4,100. The 50 day moving average is about 4,000. So that would be probably a good place if you want to pick up a little more Ethereum because of its very short supply becoming deflationary and its wide usage and huge adoption and network effect. So not financial advice, but if you need a taste, 4,020 could be good. Let's talk about Solana real quick. Solana, uh, this is the third crypto tracked by Bloomberg on the Bloomberg terminals. If you guys know what they are, anybody in professional traders out there will be very familiar with what that is. And having that on there, it follows Bitcoin and Ethereum. Notice they haven't looked at anybody else. And Bloomberg, they tout uh, Solana as the Ethereum killer for its potential for mass adoption. So not me talking here, Bloomberg talking. And uh, it is currently, you know, it's up ahead of uh, Cardano again. And depending on not, if you, if you consider Tether a <laughs> crypto, I don't as a stale coin, but it would actually be third. Anyway, that's the Bloomberg news on Solana. Let's look at the Solana chart. Now, this is uncanny. We're going to talk a lot about the FIB 0.382 level a lot today. This is the level where exactly where Solana has hit again my snipe zone of $2.21. You've heard me talk about that level for a long time. It's now hit it five or six times. I can't even count how many times it's bounced off this 221 level. It did breach it, went down to about 218. So we'll see where it goes. But uh, as I say, that's a good place to maybe accumulate a little bit. Remember, we were buying Solana. This is what people just don't understand, though, as well. We were <laughs> buying Solana for 20 bucks a few months ago and a lot less than that earlier this year. So um, it's it's hard to wrap your head around how you can buy something for 20 bucks in the summer. And now it's, you know, 10 times, 11 times the price. How is that even possible? Well, it's still possible because it still has so much value. Again, look at it not as it's gone up 11 times. Look at it compared to the comparative market cap valuation of Ethereum, because that's what it's going after next. So that's kind of how my thesis, and that's why I still buy Solana 221, even though my cost basis is a lot lower, because I can't find better things to buy. Now, this is a little bit of concerning news. Now, I analyzed this morning, I looked at 100 of my top watch list charts, which includes things in full disclosure that I shouldn't be looking at, but I look at just to keep tracks on. Now, this is the only one of three or four uh, tokens that had this same potential for a death cross. Now, it is very concerning. The red line there that I extended with the green line is the 50 day moving average. It's coming down. The blue line is a 200 day moving average is going up. I believe if this projection continues, we could have a car down on death cross on December 3rd this year. So 2021, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. For it not to happen, Cardano needs to go to $2.80, $3 real fast. And I'm just, I'm just not sure that's going to happen. Now, even if we do see a Cardano death cross, it doesn't mean it's dead. Only 60% of the time, it means it's very bad, a very bad omen. And the way Charles Hoskinson is talking about 2022 being the year for Cardano gives me some concern. So we're going to monitor this carefully and see what happens. But and the only way Cardano can avoid this death cross is to get to three bucks, three fifty, real fast. So we'll see if that happens. I don't know if it will. Let's look at the Phantom chart. I had a lot of questions today about this one because on I think it was November first or November second, I did my Phantom. Should I buy? Now I did like it. I just felt it was a little bit expensive. Now I did say in my video, in full disclosure, you can see my face. I said. I might get a nibble at about 221. When I did my video, it was at 280. Today, it's at 220 again. So it's back in my kill zone. It smashed all the way down to $2, but I did not buy. I was watching it. Um, but the key thing to focus on here is, look at that level. It's the 0.382 FIB again, which is actually support. And it's just under the 50-day moving average too. So that was kind of an interesting point. For those who want to get a little bit of Phantom, this price is not bad. Remember, it was nearly at $3 a few days ago. 
So it's in the kill zone. I didn't buy. Uh, I said I might take a nibble, but I'm looking at some other things instead. So speaking of the 0.382 fib level, this is Chainlink. And here we are. Chainlink has been on a bit of a roller coaster, I'm afraid, everybody. And uh, it, it's been kind of a, a lackluster token over the last four or five months. But here, the fib level, you can see 0.382 right there. Uh, it is also similarly at exactly the 50-day moving average too. And it's bouncing off. So, And they just fell from 38 bucks. So this is um, kind of disappointing weakness, but a lot of uh, everything's getting hammered right now. Some things are falling more than others. Next, we have Polygon Matic. This one was at $2.15 also a couple of weeks ago, beginning of the month. And now it's back at $1.56, which also, I wish I could just speak live to the audience now, it's the 0 0.382 Fibonacci level. These lines don't change. These lines I've drawn ages ago. They've been in previous videos. They don't change. And the reason they don't change is because it's important for me to keep an eye on exactly where things were versus my original projections, where historical resistance and support levels are, and to be able to work them into identifying limit orders. This one has been disappointing as well. So we'll see. Finally, little two last pieces of news. One, uh, back to Bitcoin. And there was a ton of charts I could have uh, looked at today, but I didn't. But back to Bitcoin. This guy, Jack Dorsey, it looks like he's lost a little bit of weight or his shirt is too big. But uh, he is now going to enable Bitcoin taproot from the Cash App, which basically means anybody with the Cash App, I have the Cash App, customers will be able to send Bitcoin to taproot enabled wallets for almost zero fee, which is really cool. So I don't know if you've ever tried to move crypto from one wallet to another, but with Taproot, it'll be, you'd be able to move like a billion dollars for like $2 if you wanted. So that'll be an exciting thing to watch for. And uh, we'll talk more about what are Taproot enabled wallets in a future session, if anybody's interested. And I have another piece of great news. Uh, I am gonna be on at 10 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow morning which is 7 p.m. Central Europe time with CTO Larson. And we're going to talk about blockchain technology and which one will rise. Now, CTO Larson is a very smart individual. He's the guy behind 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, worked at Ericsson for 20 years as a CTO, has deployed telco networks. I've always been of the belief that there's a huge similarity between telco technology and Metcalf's law, network effects, security, scalability, all that type of stuff, and crypto. They're basically the two industries that have the underpinnings of the technology that's the same. So I'm going to quiz him tomorrow on what he thinks. What does it take to be the most successful blockchain and take over the world? So stay tuned for that, and I'll see you here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with CTO Larson, who will be coming in live from Sweden. We're going to this live too, so hope everybody likes the content. Smash the like if you like, and uh, subscribe if you haven't. And I'm also pleased to announce that uh, this channel has added 65,000 new subscribers in 28 days. So it's growing real quick. So thank you all for the support. And if there's any stickers out there, really appreciate it as well. Everything is donated. And thank you all for being here. Be safe. And I'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with CTO Larson. Good night.